get it. Ignorance. Look at you. I hate you so much. <laughs> what? I hate you so much. I just, I'm sick. Of- I'm just saying if a guy breaks a girl's bed, he should at least offer to buy her a new bed. The answer is yes. And the second answer is when does this break bedding occur? This, see, no. For quality assurance purposes. It occurred at night. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we have a time. We have a setting. Okay, so it occurred at night. What was happening on the bed? Were you two um, having like a chair session? Were you guys playing a game? Were you playing it was a 12, game? Twelve monkeys jumping on the bed. Did it was one fall some off jumping. And bump their head. It was some jumping. We played okay. a game. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so Twister, or were you guys playing hopscotch, double dutch? Um, leapfrog, in a, in a sense. Oh, so so wrestling basically. You guys were playing WWE. Uh, I don't know if it was WWE. Um, <laughs> WWE is kind of fake. So wow. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, whatever was happening was real. In other words, it was. I'm just saying, you know, just don't be breaking beds and don't offer to buy a new one that's all i'm saying now, as someone who has been in a scenario where a bed has broken or when i was engaging in activity well i fixed my bed so i, I don't know well the thing you. is I, I think i think this is a two different because when i was engaging with activity and my bed broke i had to replace the bed the other person was not obligated to pitch it but i feel like in your case uh when the bed was uh broken uh, you feel like that other person was obligated or has a responsibility to chime in to the bed fund, correct? Yeah. I need a brand new bed. This is smelling like like fresh gender bias. You know that, right? I need a brand new bed. And if, I, if I'm in my bed alone and my bed is not broken, it's not my fault. Mm, I see. So the question is, does the other person have to chime in for your new bed to, for it to potentially be broken again? Or are we investing in a stronger frame so this never happens again? This frame was strong. It was just one round of leapfrog where it kind of gave way because it was something a little extravagant. But other than that, it's fine. It, that, it was fine before. It's mm. been fine. It was just mm. that one time. Mm. Now, my question is, was this a lightning round? Or was oh, this more my like a God. Okay, minute? we're not talking about this, but we're done. Oh, we're done. But you brought You're it. done. You brought it. You're done. You. I'm, I was just saying that if... I, so, if you were having some kind of wrestling, I don't know, I guess you like <laughs> WWE, um, and you broke somebody's bed, are you not going to buy them a new bed? I would feel bad. <laughs> no, you men you know every day i just feel like i want to be single forever i feel like i'm just not going to find my person because okay, how about this how men's, about- <laughs> men's is just getting me on my nerves left and right and how- i think maybe that's what my path is because how about this how about if a bed is broken if a piece of furniture is broken due to romp rompings um and let's say I offer to contribute to said bed repair and the other person says, no, thank you. I'm good. Do I still push or do I allow them to do their thing? You push. But pushing got y'all into trouble to begin with. So pushing didn't, pushing didn't. I said leaping. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Semantics. Yeah. All right. (laughs) The end is. First of all, I don't know who is um, denying money to get their bed fixed because I slept on a broken bed and it was not comfortable. This is why I had to get it fixed. I so, see. Well, um, most men who probably don't even have a bed frame don't have to worry about repairing said bed. So You know, that's the best sex. Hmm, Horrible. It? it is. It's so bad. It's so bad. This is a whole... <laughs> This is a and whole this topic is, and, in and, itself. And, the mattress that, on the floor. <laughs> and in this, and in this one statement, you are now supporting bed frameless niggas. 
Good job. <laughs> Good job. They got all this energy. They're not building beds and they don't got no money to <laughs> buy beds or fix beds. So what the fuck they got to do? Like, come on. Wow. Good job. All right. Well, just watch what you're advocating for. That's all I can say. I'm not advocating for anything. Listen, I used to struggle and had a mattress on the floor until I got my bed frame. Like nothing yeah. wrong with that. Right. But adult. sometimes some of the best sex comes from that. Okay. Because it's cl- it's closer to the ground. You feel mm. one with the earth. Mm. You're grounded. You're mm. calm. You're collected. And mm-hmm. you're just there. <laughs> You ain't oh, shit. Right. Well, this this episode you is not shit. sponsored by Sealy's or uh, tempur <laughs> wow. So we're just going <sighs> to keep it pushing, shall we? I, I can't stand your ass. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, one and all, to another episode of Sophisticated Ignorance. I'm Vixen J. I'm Rovi A. I a. Uh, mm-hmm. Welcome back. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, oh man, episode 199. I smell it. We're almost there to the big 200. Uh, what a milestone. I can't wait to uh, celebrate and partake with all of you. But until you're going to buy me for our 200th episode. Whew, <laughs> that is a fantastic question. Maybe a bet or contribute to the bed fund. <laughs> I think that's going to be it. I think it's time for me to go. I, I think it's time for me to go. <laughs> I think that's the best friend. You're picking violence. The best, the best gift anybody can give. My bed is fixed now. Okay. So I'm good. All right. We get it. Good. I'm glad that, that it's fixed. Whatever. Shout, shout outs to Ray Moore and Flanagan. Uh, you know what? Anyways. <laughs> uh, yes. Another week. Another week. Hope you guys are doing well out there. We are well into uh the holiday season i hope you guys have fulfilled your gift giving and you know all of your decorations are up and at them and you know we are just um getting ready for the major holiday season and that's a good thing so hope you guys are really uh in the spirit it's okay to be a grinch too uh i've been called judgmental and i don't like it some people embrace it maybe you should now, is a Grinch a holiday bitch? Lightning, uh, lightning uh, uh, question. I've, Ten seconds. I've never, I've never heard that term. I, I this is the first. I'm flabbergasted. <laughs> uh, Four, three, <laughs> no, this is no. This is no. no. Yeah. A Grinch is not a holiday bitch. Are you sure? I don't think so. I've never heard of that. Well, How just, could you defame uh, Dr. Seuss's great works like that? Is that what it's called? Uh, great. I mean, wasn't the Grinch a bitch? Not like a like a scaredy bitch. More like a I'm a raging bitch. I don't know. Actually, the Grinch didn't like the holidays. The Grinch didn't like people in Whoville. And oh. that qualifies as being a say it with me. I wouldn't say holiday, maybe just in general, but not a holiday. I think he likes the, because at the end of the movie, he changed his whole demeanor about the actual holiday. So I don't think it's the holiday per se. And I don't, I I actually align with the Grinch because people get on my nerves as well too. So, boop. All right. But the difference is you're not not a bitch, so to speak, or holiday. I've, I never been called either one actually i've been called a lot of things but not that so gotcha (laughs) and let it stay that way because if y'all act up then it'll be problems thank you so much oh thankfully you got my back of course and thankfully you've evolved i have and you know what and a lot of people a lot of people make fun of me when I say that because they're like, oh, you keep running to that. That's your excuse. That's your like go-to line. As it should be. But the more that I say it, the more I feel my evolution growing. So mm-hmm. it's like really great positive affirmations for me. And I feel like I have evolved a lot because I was a bad seed. I was terrible. <laughs> I was terrible. Like, I don't know why I had this angst. I was just, oh. I mean, look, we were young. We were whatever. So it's, it no, 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 no. This, this is still current. 
Oh, oh, as in 2021. <laughs> we're not, we're not going back to no, I've like, evolved. Teenage. I'm just saying. Gotcha. Right. It sounds it creeps up because you know they just be getting man the amount of emails that people don't read. You know, just people be people. In. How do you how do you how do you have a job at a higher institute and you don't read the email and then you respond and say, "What should I do?" And there's clear cut instructions with bullet points, <laughs> spaces in between, um, a whole picture, like, and I'm like, these are people, everyday people that I need to trust with my life, like. Correct. Yes. I get scared and I get scared that I'm being an adult now. Like we the new adults and I'm really fearful for my life, but. Yes, this whatever. generation of adults are creepy. They're scary. But you gotta, you gotta deal because, you know, coins are to be made, I guess. Yeah. But until then, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, just gotta handle the grown up babies as they are. <laughs> Because that's really what they are, grown-up babies uh, with responsibilities. All right. Anyway, I'm rambling. All right. <laughs> but speaking of children, this actually is a good segue. Look, I did a good segue in this episode. Speaking of grown-ass kids, we, Lapse. this episode, are going to be talking about children and the concept of innocence and what that means. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I feel like, especially lately, uh, there's been a lot of conversations about, you know, what children should and shouldn't be. And um, especially I was um, watching this movie Passing. Um, hmm. Passing is this, uh, it's a movie on Netflix, which the whole premise is uh, these two black women, uh, one is passing as a fair skinned well, well, one is a fair-skinned black woman who's passing as white. This whole thing, whatever. But within the context of that movie, or within the movie, there is a part where um, there's a uh, the father of one of the main protagonists. He is instilling, or he's sharing, like very traumatizing um, stories of black people being like mistreated and lynched and assaulted and all these things. And this mm. is all the way. And the movie takes place back in like the 1920s. So um, the father's like sharing all of these very traumatic experiences and stories um, with his younger boys. And the premise is that he wants to, you know, inform them about the world around them. You know, uh, there okay. was one, uh, it, it, within the movie, um, one of his sons gets called uh, the N-word in school. And, wow. you know, he kind of comes home and he tells his parents about what happened. The mother's like, yo, you know, things Set happened. it off? No, the, mother, the mother's really just like, hey, you know, this is a bad situation, but we don't even have to get into the whole big conversation about that. Yes. And the father's like, yo, no, this is the real world. You know, our kids are going to experience these things. These are, this is the right time to have this discussion. So mm -hmm. for me, I wanted to kind of dive it a little bit into more of how we treat children when it comes to protecting them from the real world, or should we maintain the level of innocence uh, that we tend to put onto children in that case? You know what I mean? Um, yeah, that sounds heavy. Yeah. I mean, because think about when we were younger and how we were protected from certain topics or even within our family, like we were kind of closed off from like really bad scenarios that were going mm -hmm. on, especially Ground, our parents. Talks, like yep. the fact that, you know, when our parents would argue, they would try to like do it like behind our backs so we didn't know what was going on. And then, you know, in front of in front of us, we think everything is like roses, but then mm -hmm. behind our backs, there would be arguments, like, you know, disagreements and all these things. And we would never see that side of them because I feel like our parents were trying to protect our quote unquote innocence. You know yep. what I mean? So I feel yep. like that trope has been played out for so long. Um, so when we do grow up and unfortunately we see these ugly truths, then we're like, oh shit, wait, where did this come from? I never knew. You know what I mean? Um, so I feel like, you know, that's definitely something that kind of plays a role. Even now with some of these, um, you know, certain cases or certain uh, policies that are being uh, produced in the school structure. So for example, 
there is uh, the story that's been out recently about um, the whole conversation of school boards and how they uh, perceive or how they handle the topic of critical race theory. And for those who are not familiar with that, um, you know, according to this article that I read, critical race theory states that US social institutions, such as the criminal justice system, education, labor uh, markets, et cetera, mm -hmm. are laced with racism embedded in laws, regulations, rules and procedures that lead to different outcomes by race, right? So that's the proper, that's the proper um, breakdown of what critical race definition, theory is. Yeah. But within school structures, I feel that, or not I feel, but that's commonly misconstrued by white people, especially, this is a very white facing topic. A lot of white people, when it comes to the concept of critical race theory, they misconstrue it as, oh, white people are all evil. They're the cause of everything bad that's happening in the world. And I feel like, you know, the reason why these school boards are having these type of arguments when it comes to race is because white people are very apprehensive about how they're viewed, especially in a historical context. So they wanna ban certain resources or conversations or um, curriculums that will, I guess, quote unquote, support the notion of white people being the bad guy, right? So we have a lot of school boards that uh, tend to shy away from conversations about slavery and race and other things because they, they wanna perpetuate this you know, but right. they can't do that. They can't do that because even growing up in like the 90s and 2000s, race and our law in this country has been a big topic. And, you know, I get, I know that white people don't want uh, white children to feel bad for themselves, but we have to really look at where racism will start, you know? And again, like you're talking about with children, there's like this big like avenue, like a, like a gap between like innocence and experience. So a child may be innocent to a certain age until they experience their first like taste of racism. And at that point, they don't have the tools or the knowledge to know how to go about it. So by, trying to withhold what the truth is would only hinder themselves. Because when you think of innocence, you think of, you know, good times, a, a place of imagination. You go into a different space where everything is a-okay. Um, I wouldn't even say perfect. Like it's just a space of everything is just fine. There's no worries. There's no cares. There's no hatred. It's just pure love. And until somebody says, oh, what did you do to your hair? Or why does your nose look like that? Something as innocent as that can go and transcend into something bigger. Okay, so all black people here are like this. Mm. All black people's noses are like this. And this is how it starts. And if there's no foundation for children to understand that before they can go out and experience it for themselves, that's where I guess the critical race theory can go and fill in that gap in between innocence and experience. You know, I don't know. Cause it, God forbid a child goes through a traumatic experience and that just fucks up their whole innocence and they have no idea where it's coming from. It'll hurt them more that they're saying, Hey, this person was my friend. And you know how kids are mm -hmm. one day you're my best friend next day. I hate you. And that could just be detrimental. So, you know, Susie and Jeremy are best friends, you know. Susie's white, Jeremy's black. Today, Susie loves Jeremy. You know, they're playing together in the sandbox. Everything's going well. The next day, Susie doesn't want to talk to Jeremy. Jeremy does not know why. Susie doesn't know why. But Susie may have heard something from her parents. And she doesn't understand what it is because she's still kind of innocent. She doesn't understand what it is, but the context and the tone behind it, she knows that she's not supposed to be playing with Jeremy. And then it just stems from there. Now, Jeremy already has his experience and then he's, you know, going to take that with him like, oh, well, white girls don't want to play with me now. It must be because my skin is black. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. And that's, and, and once again, you know, I mean, depending on the age and depending on you know i guess the level of education in those realms 
it's going to be very hard to understand why certain things happen the way they do. And, you know, education from both sides, it's not just the schools, but it's from home as well. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it comes from both ends. And, you know, if you're taught a certain way at home and you go to school and you're taught a different way, I, I feel like those two ideologies clash. And then also, once again, I feel like from the school's end, they're trying to curtail or they're trying to like curate, you know, what kids should be learning. And that's a disservice, right? Because it keeps them ignorant. Right. But the, but by them keeping children ignorant by eliminating like certain conversations and stuff, it prevents them from having a better idea of the world from, from early. So kind of back to the to the notion, um, the type of legislation, the type of legislations that come from, um, you know, these type of discussions, uh, it says here that uh, they mostly banned the discussion, training, and or orientation that the U.S. is inherently racist, as well as any discussions about conscious and unconscious bias, privilege, discrimination, and oppression. These parameters also extend beyond race to include gender, lectures, and discussions. So it's not just about race, but it, it, it carries across gender. It probably crosses into the queer community and all these things. Like they're basically just trying to prevent or, or you know, diminish or eliminate any type of discussion that, you know, gives proper representation to different you know, groups, uh, you know, in our society, you know, when it comes to kids, because probably these school boards feel like, oh, these topics are too heavy, you know, they're too complex. But funny enough, I posted on our socials recently of this kid, like sitting in his classroom talking about like the whole, um, he was talking about the OJ Simpson trial or like OJ, the OJ Simpson series that was on like a streaming service recently mm -hmm. and he was breaking that down in his classroom and this kid must have been like nine or ten at most and he was breaking down the complexities of how like the you know the prison system is unfair and unjust and how the judicial system plays a role in that and this kid is like preaching he's spitting the shit right and he must have learned it from somewhere i mean i'm pretty sure they weren't teaching that at school so if he right. did get that from him home or from conversations with his parents more than likely, and he's bringing that to a school system, I feel like that's the type of conversations that these school boards are trying to avoid, right? Yeah. Because it goes against their curriculum and it goes against what they're actually trying to promote. So, you know, I feel like, you know, we do see examples of, you know, younger kids, depending on the type of environment they grow up in, being a lot more in tune than their other, you know, I guess. But we have to be stuff. because of the experience. And right. that's why I said the, the line between innocence and experience is, is a, that's a fragile line. Once that's broken, you can never get your innocence back. The first time you experience racism and you realize that, hey, people really don't like me based on the color of my skin, it it shines a light on a child's head and say, hey, I have to de build defense mechanisms up now, you know? And that falls on us as a community. That's why I'm like, it's like home and school and our communities to defend our history and like our rights and humanity. And I think this also can lie within like the roots of allyship. And that mm -hmm. comes even more important when you are transitioning from your innocence into your experience, you know what I mean? And it's like, at that point, Black America has to educate ourselves because the education system does not do it for us. They don't educate and inform. And this is why there's so many disparities between Black and white people till this day, because mm -hmm. they refuse to let white people know the true value and history behind what has happened to Black people for years. Let's and that see. conversation <laughs> mm -hmm. will never happen if these school boards don't act accordingly, you know? We, we have to be like a catalyst for change. Yeah. It's a sad double-edged sword because it's like, all right, if you are eliminating the concept of teaching, you know, kids at a certain age about these very hard topics or social topics right so let's say let's take it from a racial angle all right if black kids aren't taught about the proper you know 
history of racism or you know critical race theory in their classrooms, they're hindered from actually understanding like the real complexities of it all. From a white perspective, if they're not taught properly, then they're going to be grown up with ignorance, and then that ignorance is going to snowball into them being mm -hmm. older and feeling like, yo, race isn't an issue. What what's the problem? I don't see color and stuff yep. like that. Or if anything, they're gonna in, they're gonna develop an inherent racism to where it's like, yo, I'm not racist. I don't, you know, because they don't understand, they don't have the complexities or they don't have the structure of it that could have been introduced at a younger age. And you know, some may argue that kids are not ready for those type of conversations, and others may argue where the better, the best time to introduce these conversations is at a certain age or when they're young. And I feel like the innocence factor is less about, oh, exposing them to harsh truths and they'll never be the same, but it's more like how you do it, right? I right. mean, I feel like, you know, when we were younger, we never, we definitely did not learn about very hard, harsh truths, except, all right, right. We learned about slavery, but very minimally, like during Black History Month. Right, like slavery well, was something that was very. Maybe your experience was different. I do remember we do have different schooling, or like young yeah. schooling experiences. So probably talk about yours a little bit because mine, I know when it came to like, you know, topics where, as I said, like slavery and all these things, it was touched on, but not a lot. So I know you have a different. Well, uh, well, with my um. My elementary school, we had two Black teachers who were a married couple. I love them to death. I'm not even going to say their names. They taught us about um, Black history even before Black History Month. You know what I mean? That's where I first learned about Megan Evers. I did my first diorama with him. I learned about, we were going through the OJ trial at the time as well too. Again, learning about different things, seeing their reaction, understanding why they had a standpoint for um, OJ going through. And at that time, everybody had one TV in the classroom and we were watching and analyzing and doing those things. So I was exposed to that. When I went to junior high school, I had another, uh, another teacher. Um, he was great. He was young though. And I still see him uh, on my block. He was at my corner <laughs> store recently. I'm not gonna shout out his name. He's on Facebook too, but he was great. He was the uh, like the the epitome of a black man who's trying to give back to his community. He mm -hmm. had on his lug boots, like lugs was the thing okay, back in the day. <laughs> exactly. He was he was the coolest, and and guess what he taught? Social studies. Mm -hmm. He was the only professor professor teacher who made us like know more about black uh, culture than anything. And, and you know what's so funny? Not one person disagreed with his antics. He even brought Amistad for us to watch. Wow. And that was, that was, that was a tough one to watch. Yeah, like, you know yeah. what I mean? But they exposed us to so much. And it wasn't like somebody went home and said, oh my God, we watched Amistad in class. And then a parent came in the next day and said, I think that's too graphic for our kids. No, we were all black and brown children. We were all um, Afro-Latin, Puerto Rican, Dominicans. I grew up in East New York, Brooklyn, and we all had that. And then there were like a couple of white children in class, but nobody was like, oh my God, I feel like this is something that's detrimental to me. Let me report it, even the other teachers. So I, I am privileged to have that experience so I can be aware of what was out there. I would say at home, I didn't get that same experience because again, I'm from a Caribbean background. Mm -hmm. My parents didn't have to experience racism. So that wasn't something that, you know, I went to my parents and spoke about or they spoke to me openly about because they came from such a small island and yeah, there were white people there, but it never was a power a issue of power or class or anything like that there so they never experienced the type of racism that black people in america had to you know when i was young i was exposed to dr king's uh i have a dream speech at five years old at ps 13 I, I this is me in first grade 
they exposed us like and, and I think that's within the community. Now, if you go to some place like Virginia or mm-hmm. someplace down south where it's predominantly white and you have the five scattered black kids in first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, one kid per class. That's what I mean, five scattered children. And they need to know about their race theory as well, too. Of course, there's going to be a lot of pushback with that because they, they don't want white people to look bad for white mm-hmm. children. Mm-hmm. And that and that is that is the main argument. There's no other argument other than just saying what history is. They're just it's really history, yeah. social science, whatever. But they don't want to make white children feel bad for what their ancestors have done. Thousand percent. Yeah, you know, um, similar to you, like growing up in the inner city, um, you know, I had different experiences with learning certain things uh, versus, you know, uh, younger and older. Like when I was in elementary school, I had all white teachers. So when it came Ooh. to, so when it came to the, the discussions Excuse of me. like, you know, black history and stuff like that, brushed over very light. I remember learning more about Hanukkah from one of my teachers than like black <laughs> history. And mind you, she was teaching like a predominant black class. So it really, I feel like even though the curriculums are what they are, it really comes down to the teacher themselves and how they want to conduct their class and what they want to introduce to their class when it comes to certain topics. Um, You know, I also remember in junior high school and high school, I had different professors, black professors, professors different black teachers who would i did the same thing i know it's just like (laughs) we're old now we don't talk yeah but you know they would do their best to introduce very well i guess you could call them sensitive but very like relevant topics about race and stuff like that to you know the classroom because they understood the type of demographic that they were catering to um and you know, most of these conversations that we're talking about, like the school boards and all these things, these are all taking place in, as you were mentioning, like Southern states or like Midwest states. These are not mm-hmm. conversations happening in like the Northeast of states, like New York and all these things. Like we're not dealing with that. We're, we're so diverse, right? We're, we're more progressive in that case. You know what I mean? Um, these Southern states, all these things, once again, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to deal with or face that stigma of, oh, white people are the worst or not, well, not in that statement, but white people have done wrong historically, especially systematically in this country. They don't want to face that. So they're going to ban everything that deals with adversity or diversity. They're going to ban everything that deals with like different, you know, orientations and all these things. They're going to ban all these things because they just don't want those truths to infiltrate, you know, their, their children when, they're at a certain age and it's a disservice once again because it's like you're not properly preparing these kids for the real world and this is where the innocence comes in because it's like all right you're going to keep them in this very cocoa melon bubble where everything's all happy dory but you know when they get older they're going to see things and they're not going to understand it and that's where their implicit biases are going to certainly like play a role and it just fucks the generation up, you know what I mean? So I just don't understand why, you know, these, oh, I understand why these particular uh, systems are designed or trying to design themselves the way they are, but it just does a disservice. But yeah. the bigger topic is, I mean, outside of these two examples, because I feel like these two examples just um, play a role between like the book banning, um, you know, the book banning uh, that's happening in St. Louis where, school boards are banning certain books that cover diverse topics like you know queerness and race and all these things um but i think the bigger issue is and i guess we could just talk you know candidly whereas like um when do we think or how do we think you know kids should be informed about like hard social issues um and for me i feel like I mean, I don't know if this is right or wrong. I guess there's no right or wrong answer, so to speak. But I feel like, you know, I would be comfortable introducing these type of topics, you know, when I have kids. I would be, I would be comfortable introducing these type of topics when my kids are exposed to them and they start asking questions. But before mm-hmm. that, 
like I, I don't know if I will be equipped to like say, hey, son or daughter or whatever, I have to sit down and give you the race talk. You know what I mean? Because like, right. if you're not equipped for that, then it will be hard to have that type of conversation where you want them to understand, but they might be too young to like take all the complexities in and you don't want to do a disservice by not properly having that conversation. What do you think? Or, or even just to piggyback having, when you said the sit down race talk, but I know that a lot of um, moms and fathers out there, especially when they have black sons, um, Mm -hmm. especially, you know, when the movie came out, The Hate You Give, based on the book, um, there was a, a, a big, like, I don't know if you remember, like social media type of platform where you see more fathers sitting down uh, with their sons and talking to them about, you know, being black and being a man and, right. you know, dealing with police and police brutality. And, you know, it, it, it went from being like the rite of passage, you know, like birds and the bees, like around 16 or whatever, they, they want to talk about sex, but you see that there was like a, pattern where the age kept going lower and lower for for young black boys and it's like now maybe eight nine ten right. you have to start having these conversations with our black boys and let them know that hey you are a potential target you know that and and who knows when the age of innocence is lost but at that moment they have to unfortunately be exposed to the experience that something could happen to you and you can be murdered because you're black and that that is the harsh sensitive truth you know and there's no like magic formula for you to talk to your children or talk to kids and expose them to the experience of being black you know unfortunately we don't have that but you know, just being truthful, I think, is the key to be able to talk about something that's uncomfortable for both parties, you know, because these are topics that need to be discussed. Um, children need to know when to feel safe versus unsafe. And, you know, as parents or even um, parental-like figures like teachers or a mentor or a big brother, you just have to make yourself available to children and let them know that any topic, how big, how scary, how sensitive, how uncomfortable it could be, is open for discussion because you rather them know it from a place of understanding and a place that you know that they you can break it down for them instead of them trying to find it out on themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just kind of similar to that uh, example that I- I shared earlier with that movie Passing where the the son, you know, was called a nigger in school and Mm -hmm. then he went home and had to like tell his parents about it and how they reacted differently where it's like, Mm. you know, unfortunately. Yeah, that's why I was asking questions. They didn't want to ring the alarm. like. (laughs) Well, mind you, this is the 1920s. So, I mean, (laughs) contextually in the sense of the time (laughs) and era, things are a little different than now. If that shit would happen in you know, 2021, you know, AD, shit would uh, definitely pop off. But, um, but you know, it's, it, once again, it kind of comes to the fact of like, you know, if you have these conversations with, you know, kids of a young age, are you preventing them from properly like enjoying their childhood? You know, um, I think about mm. me, like I never, my dad, my parents never had these type of talks with me. I, I, I'm trying yeah. to think about the first time I've ever been exposed to like these harsh issues in my real, in my like young life to where it's like, oh shit, like I heard, you know, someone called me a nigga for the first time or, yo, I saw this crazy thing on the news that, you know, like a black person was killed or police violence or police brutality. Like I'm trying to remember if I was ever exposed to that when I was a kid and I can't really recall too much. You know, I definitely know that, you know, these separate conversations were really had. I think the toughest conversation I had was like in junior high school. And I remember our dean, um, like they had a they had a um, assembly for the boys and the girls. And basically it was um, that conversation was about like 
sexual assault or sexual harassment. And that's probably like the deepest convo that I had at that age where they were talking to the boys about, yeah, you know, you can't touch girls inappropriately and, you know, consent. And, you know, depending on what you do, if you do touch someone inappropriately, then that could, you know, lead you to big trouble. That's probably like the deepest convo that I remember having as a kid. And even before that elementary school, we had family living, just like sex ed, but, Mm -hmm. you know, that wasn't extremely deep. I think once again, that assembly in junior high school was probably like the deepest, like, whoa, this is a, this is a big topic. Now, I think at that age, we weren't really, um, we weren't really capsulizing how deep it was. I just think, you know, I guess according to the school or to the school standards, it was a conversation that had to be had. But I feel like at that age, I certainly was not taking in how serious of a conversation that was. You know what I mean? And I feel yeah. like it it's in, in that case, it's like, are we doing a disservice depending on the age or, you know, the level of where the youth is at to have these conversations where it may go over their heads? Or should we instill these conversations because they're important and hope we're hoping that they like kind of sponge it or soak it up, you know? And that's where I kind of don't really know the answer to that. Yeah. Um, what don't. about you? Like when, when, when can you recall like, you know, like in the sense of like a hard topic, like when can you recall like the youngest you were ever exposed to like something other you know, on the news or just like in real life and, and that became a conversation. So again, I think the youngest I've been exposed, because I went to a predominantly black school was was the OJ Simpson trial. Mm -hmm. It was because that's how that's really opened up my eyes to um, cause I, again, again, Caribbean background, we weren't exposed to like whites being better. So I always felt like everybody was on the same playing field and equal playing field. But when they were trying to, I guess, you know, everybody wanted OJ to be, uh, innocent. So, um, I was exposed to the black man, white woman dynamic. Cause that was my first time ever seeing anything like that because I wasn't exposed I've always thought you know black people got together white people got together yeah. there was never <laughs> there was never any type of meeting of the two yeah right so when I saw that you know and how everyone was going crazy saying oh well she's this and she's that and she married him for his money and if he wasn't this uh he would just been a regular black man and these are just things people just saying in passing and I'm like is that how people view black men mm -hmm. as as lower than? And that's when I first got exposed to it. I did my first because even before you know, I was I told you I was a young guy. I was exposed to Dr. King's. I had a dream speech that enlightened me, uh, empowered me for black people. But I didn't know about the the hardships behind right. it until like I, I as I grew old. I was in fourth grade. As I grew older. I started to understand that, hey, there's a reason why Dr. King said that speech because people had to go through this. Like I learned about Rosa Parks from then. I learned about Megger Evers from then. I learned about how much racial disparities. I saw pictures of whites only, blacks only um, water fountains. That's where I first got exposed to that kind of stuff. When I got into college, that was a different experience. Sure. I didn't experience any type of racism in high school. Again, I went to a predominantly Black high school, but when I went to college upstate, that's when we started to see a little bit more. Like I went to the store in the mall, Oakdale Mall in Binghamton, and I had a woman follow me in the store mm. for no reason. And of course, who's stealing? the young like teeny bopper tween little girls who are who were white girls they're like trying to put lip gloss in their pockets or whatever I'm like why are you following me I'm like you're you're really following me I'm like I don't want to buy anything in the store but I know you have no financial ties to the store I really wanted to get this hot topic shirt but you're all <laughs> up in my grill like why why are you following me right. and that's like my first that 
that was my first out of like my community, my safe space realm of racism. I'm Mm -hmm. like, I have money. I came to the store to buy something and you're following me like I'm going to steal something. Right. And that, 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 uh, that's when I started saying, all right, now my guard is all the way up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But notice how, notice how we had to experience those things. Like you experienced that later on in life, right? That that Mm -hmm. level of racism and stuff like that. Because once again, the way we grew up, we grew up in the communities where that wasn't really uh, a thing because we, there was no instance where racism could kind of, well, I mean, then again, you know, once again, I just did point out the fact that in elementary school, I had all white teachers, right? So mm-hmm. we don't even know if a level of racism was probably taking place just within those instances where, you know, our With teachers- the hiring were, process, right. yeah. Well, the hiring process, but if anything, maybe our teachers were teach were um, either teaching us differently or disciplining us differently as predominant, like a predominant black class, you know what I mean? We, I don't even, right. I can't even begin to think if there was any nuance there, right? Because, you know, as I said, these white teachers are coming from wherever they are, coming into the inner cities, teaching these black classes. And I remember like one of my elementary school teachers was particularly mean to, to us. And I don't know, and I don't know if that was because she was just a bitch or she just saw black kids and said, oh, these kids need extra discipline. Who knows? You know, it's a big question mark. But as I said, there there could be potential subtle, you know, moments of racism that we haven't, that we didn't even recognize when we were kids um, and stuff like that. And once again, the exposure to it either was kind of very subtle or hidden, or it just was kind of blocked from our quote unquote innocence, right? So, I mean, if, if, Okay, so before I ask the next question, do you agree or do you feel that there should be a a level of innocence, quote unquote, when it comes to a child? There should be a, I feel like like we have an inherent form of innocence anyway. Well, I mean, as I said, innocence is used as a term, but do we feel Mm -hmm. like, you know, like a child should maintain a level of innocence when it comes to the ills of the world or just how, like how they grew up. Like, should we allow, should there be a space where we allow kids to be kids without, you know, definitely exposing definitely. them to certain things. But I, I, I agree we should allow kids to be kids, but then there are, you know, two sides to the spectrum. If you keep them too sheltered for too long, they never mm. know how to experience anything outside of what they know. But then again, I know that there's a lot of kids who grow up way too fast that know way too much and they don't even know what it is to be a kid. And they're already a 38 year old adult um, by the time they're 10. So uh, (laughs) this is, this is like a, a, a common theme, like a good balance of both. It is something that I guess parents strive to maintain. I know that some of my friends who are parents, you know, they try to break down sensitive topics as best as they can, but still have it laced with a little bit of softness behind it. You know what I mean? Something that's digestible for the child to receive and still maintain whatever innocence that they have at that age range so if it's like a six-year-old they'll they'll touch on a topic maybe give a soft introduction and as they get older they'll build on it more and I think that's probably one of the best ways to talk about something like that so they can have a level of innocence but still be exposed in pieces to what they can experience in the outside world I mean Right. I'm not a parent, but I that's the approach that I would take. That you would take, yeah. I, yeah. I, I think actually you make a good point in the sense of like introducing these topics in phases, where it's like, hey, the level one to this discussion, like for example, let's say, mm-hmm. you know, take it back to, like I was just thinking when you were talking about just the concept of this whole pandemic and all the racial turmoil that's come from it and all these things, like imagine having to like, 
you know, talk to your children about this? Like, how do you break down what this pandemic is? Something that they've, that you've never experienced before, much less mm-hmm. they have. And, exp- and like really talk about the, the danger, like the I- intimate danger of it all without, you know, kind of keeping them sheltered from it. And even think about like, you know, George Floyd and, and all the racial, you know, incidents that have happened from then, like considering this new world that we're living in, how do you properly have these conversations? Because they're more than likely learning it from class, they're seeing it on the internet. You know, as I said, generationally, kids are more exposed to things faster than than when we were kids, you know what I'm saying, when we were younger. So how do you like manage all these things that they're being exposed to much quicker than when we were young? Because at the end of the day, it's not a matter of, you know, parents sitting down and telling their, shit, their kids, hey, look, we need to have this conversation. They can go on TikTok, they can go on social media, they can go on YouTube and mm-hmm. see all these things unfold. Right. So how do we, how is it a means of like, all right, we need to control the narrative and have that conversation or it's like, all right, you're probably seeing all these things unfold. Let's have a conversation about it because that level of innocence is becoming less and less, you know, attainable because of the things that, you know, the younger generation is being exposed to at a younger age. You know what I mean? Um, thanks to technology, thanks to all these things that we have in place. So, you know, to your point, I do agree that Um, there should be a notion where you kind of introduce your child little by little. And as they get older, you know, you kind of like add more context to the conversation where they can observe, where they, where they, where they can absorb it versus, you know, kind of like saying, yo, I know you're five years old, but we need to talk about George Floyd and the racial implications of how America doesn't view Black people as equal and talk about, you know, white supremacy and oppression. Like, I'm just saying all these words and I can't imagine five-year-old me soaking that all in as, damn, this shit is wild. Yeah, no, you, you gotta, know what I mean? you gotta give it in doses. You gotta give it in doses. Yeah, that's, that's, that's basically what I'm trying to say. Like how, like these topics are important to have, but it's like. But you know, what's so funny. I feel like for our generation, that's what, our, that's what our parents did. We had that one serious talk. Mm-hmm. This is what it is. We're not touching it again. Right. <laughs> I, I don't know if yeah. that's what they knew growing up or what they experienced. And, and I'm like, oh, well, okay. Because even when I, I think I spoke with something with my mom, I was like, mom, how do you, you know, how did you ever deal with racism? And I, and I think this was in my 20s, mm-hmm. like when I just came back from college. And she was like, you know, we never really had to. That's all I was saying. We never really had to experience racism. So I can't tell you about it because that's not my experience. I never had to go through that. She only experienced that until she moved to America. To the States, yeah. Which is fucked up. I mean, this it just this, up. this country is built <laughs> off of that. So it's really no surprise. <laughs> my dad said the same thing. Like when he grew up on the islands, they never had to do with racism because once again, kind of similar, kind of pseudo similar to us, whereas like we grew up in a predominant black community. We didn't have to deal with racism, like of overt racism, at least. The same thing with our parents. They grew up on the islands. Everybody looks like them. The most racism or the most racial, you know, context that they had is probably someone that was lighter than them. Like I know my dad probably mm-hmm. grew up with just so like a colorism yeah, complex. Yeah, yeah, colorism complex. Like he probably grew up with some. I had that. High. Um, he probably grew up with someone that was albino. You know, I know there was there's like some albino people in the, in the islands. When I you know moved I mean? back to Grenada, I was the the lightest girl in the classroom, and they thought I was fair skinned I was ostracized a lot. Seriously, the, like, yeah, no, I'm no, saying, yeah, that's real. no jokes. And I'm like, wow. And you know what? It's funny that you said something like that because now that I've experienced both sides, like the Caribbean side of things and the American side of things, when I go to like a Caribbean island for like a resort or something, and I always see like the local people go up to white people and they're just so accommodating. And in my mind, I'm like, why are you so accommodating? You don't know what they be doing. They cut us in line. They act, they give a lot of microaggressions. They act like we're not there. They talk over us sometimes. Like, uh, and then I'm like, I'm, I'm looking at it as an American. Right. But also keep in mind in the Caribbean context of things, 
they their most islands were brought up under colonialism right mm -hmm. so you already have that notion and they're of, still under british rule a lot of them yeah yep. so i mean that whole notion of like british rule you have the british you know hierarchy or the all but it doesn't whatever. take away of what i feel though and i no, and i have to check myself doesn't. sometimes i have to check myself and say hey hey relax like they didn't your experience is different from their experience they didn't mm -hmm. have to go through that so take the l bite the bullet for this you don't have to go and explain that you feel away like just enjoy your vacation you have <laughs> <laughs> all inclusive relax yeah. like <laughs> but yeah when we were kids and we were in the islands or visited the islands we didn't have to worry about these things like this was not something that we ever had to think about you know what i'm saying because we're going right. to, on vacation to have fun i mean you grew up in grenada so you have a little bit of a difference experience but for the most part you you never saw racism around you when you were going to school over there oh no no absolutely not and and the one white girl that was in our class they loved her like <laughs> like her. no seriously and you know there's yeah. always a token the one white girl she like she was german can you imagine a, a token white person <laughs> a german grenadian yeah this is this is exist i don't know i don't know where she is now but um we used to be in a tight group because like we were like kind of ostracized together and then there was this one boy that was also ostracized so we were just in like in a little crew mm -hmm. but even with our little crew it wasn't like detrimental you know what i mean it was just like oh you're different bye they yeah. didn't like throw things at us make us feel bad like all the mean girls being kid stuff like we didn't experience that like it's a whole different type of me in America. Yeah, racism <laughs> is a genuine homebred American concept. It's it doesn't exist. I mean, it exists to certain levels, you know, outside of America or outside the states. Uh, I think once again, but it's mainly in, embedded in American, you know, ideologies. Um, other like foreign countries. They do experience racism, but it's not as like predominant in their historical context as as America is, you know. So there's there's definitely differences there. But all that to say, uh, when it comes to just the younger generation now, um, you know, as I was saying before, you know, the younger generation are certainly going to have access to very um, hard you know, discussions or topics, you know, at a young age, I think for us as older people, especially parents, I feel like it's just our responsibility to curate how that information is being received and, you know, make sure that you are equipped to have these conversations. That's the number one answer too, because sometimes it might be as a parent or as an older person, it might be hard to have these conversations with kids because you might not know how to talk to them. You don't know if they're receiving it well. So, I would say, you know, just make sure that you're equipped to have these conversations. And if you do decide that it's important for kids or people in, of a younger generation to receive these messages, just make sure that you're doing it in a way where they could like receive the information properly. And it doesn't go mm -hmm. too much over their head because I feel like that does a disservice. So yeah, yeah, I that's, agree. that's what I would say about that. But um, I'm glad, I'm glad that, you know, we've, I'm glad, at least for me and you, in our context, that we grew into a state where we were able to experience certain things and learn, especially at our age or at the age at the time. Um, and I'm just hoping that this new age kids could, um, <laughs> you know, kind of take in. Listen, or, these these Gen Xers, I don't know what you call them now, but they they like to fight, so they fight oh, yeah. for everything. Word. So I, I'm holding on to the little TikTok, IG, every generation that they going to come strong. I'm holding on to that. Or generation talk. Tax on me. <laughs> generation talk. Love it, love it, love it, love it. All right. And that's, that's about it. That's all we got for that topic. Uh, let us know what you think wherever you can. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts about this. And yeah, you know, um, once again, we are creeping into episode 200. Can't wait to see what comes from that. But yeah, stay tuned. And um, other than that, you can find us uh, on the social medias and everywhere else 
You can listen to us on uh, podcast platforms such as SoundCloud, Apple Podcast, Spotify, um, iHeartRadio, wherever you listen to podcasts. Also follow us on social media, on Instagram and Twitter and TikTok, as we were just talking about before. So if you're mm-hmm. a generation talk, then you can follow us in there with our fun dances and other things. Uh, <laughs> SI Podcast, SI Podcast, follow Correct. us, our handle. Correct. Also email us questions. Um, we're planning to have like a ask us anything for our episode 200. So please send in or DM us questions uh, that you'd like to know about us. That would be great. Um, to sophig podcast at gmail.com and follow me and Rovi respectfully in our DMs um, and ask us questions, give us shout outs, share the love, uh, rate us on Apple Podcasts as well. There's a whole bunch of things you can do. Um, don't be afraid to interact with us. We love to hear from y'all. And we really appreciate uh, your support. Yep. So yeah. Anything this else? This was good. Before we're out, this was good. This was great. I feel like I can I could take this away and try to apply it to. Hopefully, when I have children, I. You will. You know what? I made a really funny joke. How do you know that? I just know. You have powers. This is me manifesting for you. Oh, yeah. All right. Yep. You were saying? I forgot. I lost my train of thought. Wow. You were caught off of guard by my generous I was. I, I went. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You took my breath away. <laughs> what? That laugh, that laugh came from the gut. I didn't appreciate I it. D- I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't expect you to say that. So that's why I, I was caught off guard. That's okay. 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 It's okay. Well, well, thank you everyone for listening to us. Hope you gained something from this. Um, again, we're just trying to be insightful. Hit us up anytime and hear from us the next time you log in. Word. We'll catch y'all next time. Adios. Are, are you, wow. What, are you rock away in? This is the most Caribbean I've seen you. <laughs> Rude. Very offensive. No, I was proud of you. Wow. Okay. okay. You know Sorry. What? You I, know I what? No, nope, I take it back. The tone nope, came off you shady. lost my innocence. Okay. Wow. The tone came off shady. I'm sorry. Super. No, it did not. But you it's know good. what? Oh, I got some Chick Fil A calling me. That's gotcha. okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Catch on next That's time. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Say goodbye, Ruby. Bye, Ruby.